all for coming. We're so glad to have such an amazing turnout. And uh, we so hon we're so honored to have such an amazing lineup of speakers and panelists to discuss and share their take on the future of Homo sapiens today with us. Uh, we'd like to cordially thank everyone who helped with organization of this event, and especially our sponsors, Media Lab and McGovern Institute for Brain Research. Uh, before getting started, we'd like to introduce ourselves. We're Zapians, um, an interdisciplinary MIT collective of students and researchers exploring the topics of human enhancement, both in mind and body. This includes brain-computer interfaces, smart prosthetics, gene editing, and many more. Uh, we host events such as this one to spark interest and discussion and to inform both our members and the wider MIT community. We interface with academia, industry, and investors to better understand the landscape of work that exists and hopefully to get insight of what the future could hold for us. And uh, for this event specifically, you're super welcome to um, uh, go to the link sli.do and put in the event uh, hashtag Zapiens in order to um, give questions to our wonderful speakers and panelists. Uh, with that, I'd love to invite Joseph Paradiso to stage for opening remarks. Joe did his PhD in high energy physics with Nobel laureate Sam Ting at MIT. He worked on spacecraft control and sensor systems at Draper and CERN, and now with his responsive environments group at Media Lab is looking beyond IoT at how humans connect to the network, to the networked world that we are building. Thanks a ton, Sir Anoush and uh, uh, Zapians. Uh, it's really an honor to be here to uh, kick off and, and moderate this, this conference. Um, we live in, in, indeed, as I'm about to say here in a second, very special times. Um, the next decades, a few decades, next decade or two even, will bring changes that are going to be pretty awesome and mind-boggling. But if I go back a little bit, uh, this is my generation. That's me. Uh, as a child, 1963, very formative experience. Uh, my dad brought me to one of the MITRE buildings around here where there was, I think, an IBM 7030. Uh, the computer took a whole building. And uh, that computer is much less powerful than what I was wearing on my head with this magic leap demonstration just a couple of months ago at the Media Lab. So uh, the transformation in terms of hardware and what we can do with it has been astounding. But this is just the knee of the curve. You ain't seen anything yet. It's going to take off from here. So my generation saw stuff get small, saw some applications open up. It's yet to come. And of course, MIT plays a huge role here, going back to Vannevar Bush, uh, JCR Licklider with networking, Marvin Minsky, AI, uh, and Nicholas Ingerponti, Media Lab. Uh, these are just a few of the visionaries that really have, have pushed the edge of computing here at MIT. And it's going to continue with the College of Computing, what we're doing at the Media Lab, uh, all over the Institute. So it's part of our vernacular. It will continue to be. Um, these are my grandparents. So let's go back to the other generation. This is uh, at their house in Somerville, uh, maybe in the 40s or something like that. Um, what they saw is incredible. That dwarfs anything that I saw. They went from horse and buggy. They were born turn of the century. Uh, to a, a buggy on the moon. They lived through all of that. They went from steam power to nuclear power. They went from World War I to the Cold War. Just think of the change that they saw, you know, both in society and in terms of technology. It divorced what I think my generation has seen. But again, let's go to your generation, for the students that are in the audience. Uh, of course, uh, uh, another plug for MIT. With the moon landing, of course, the instrumentation lab and, and Charles Star Draper played a huge role in getting us to the moon. And as a plug, next week, the uh, 50th anniversary of Apollo, there, Astro is hosting uh, in Kresge Auditorium. It's going to be an incredible uh, event. Probably, many of you probably will, will, will be there, real or virtually. Um, but your generation is going to see the transformation of the human. It's going to be another change that will, will dwarf what, what I've seen. And uh, I think, indeed, the subject of this conference is going to be relevant for all of the students that are here. And uh, your names will be here. You guys will be the ones that will, will push this forward. Um, so going further back, people thought about what future humans would be for a long time. Uh, this is H.G. Wells' uh, envisioning of uh, what he called the man, man of year million in an article from 1893. And you know, this is the beginning of Darwin. He was thinking of how we would evolve away our bodies, because our bodies are like animals. They're useless, very Victorian view. We want the head, because that's the brain. Uh, so we give up our digestion, and we get nutrients from this pond that we swim in. Uh, it's uh, very cute and antiquated at some point. I'm reading, actually, Stephen Baxter's sequel to War of the Worlds, the authorized sequel. So the Martians definitely came from this view Wells had of the future of humans. 
Um, but this is how Hollywood sees the future human now. Scarlett Johansson seems to be the person they pick for the augmented human every time. Uh, and indeed, you know, big heads don't mean superhuman intelligence. I mean, this is a topological issue, right? Because connectionism is what gives intelligence to a large extent. You get a big brain, you have, to, you have to connect it, it becomes schizophrenic, how do you do that? It's not clear biology is gonna evolve much beyond our brain case. It's a change in substrate, a uh, change in what's inside that, that makes the content, makes the difference. Um, going beyond Darwin, though, people started to think, you know, around the, the, the beginning of the century, uh, how we could take charge of evolution ourselves. Of course, Huxley's Brave New World in speculative fiction is one of the, the real classics here. Um, and we're seeing this roll out now. I mean, is an age coming, for example, there are many, many things here, we'll hear more on the panel. Is the issues that are really huge issues now will be at another level. Is gender, gender as we know it, one of the possible axes that, that could exist in differentiating people? Uh, it's already starting to be decoupled from reproduction. What, what is it going to become? Uh, race is a CD's worth of edible data that isn't necessarily inherited from your ancestors or other humans, right? We can start to redefine all of these. What do they mean in this kind of a future? Uh, people have speculated from Huxley to recently uh, Yuval Harari, uh, and uh, one of the, the themes that keeps coming back is elites having access to this technology, everybody else don't, and uh, basically uh, elites will become uh, a, a new species, and then it's a huge issue. Huge issue. Or will human gene editing democratize, just like other cell phones and other technologies, so after some years, everybody has it. And if we live in a world with that, can we survive it? This is tremendously transformative, has all kinds of uh, interesting issues. Will death become just an option, one of many options? Uh, we're going to you know, hear more about that uh, with David Sinclair, but multiple medical interve interventions, artificial organs, will that get us there? Nanomachines for micro repair, fault tolerant genome, uh, uploading our mind into an electronic substrate. For those of us working in computer science, that's always the fantasy. Very hard to do. How do you wire the mind? Uh, or maybe being emulated, and this is much more practical, practical by the digital detritus we leave behind, right? We're leaving videos, we're leaving email, we're leaving commentary, we're leaving our soul. Uh, can that just be emulated? I did a business plan at a Sloan class in entrepreneurship 15 years ago about that. Now Black Mirror covers it and businesses fold out. So we live forever already. And uh, for me, the first exposure really was Heinlein's 1941 book, Methuselah's Children, uh, in science fiction, really treating that uh, in a deep way, although myth, human myth, has talked about this for thousands of years. Uh, I'm a prog rock fan. Some of you probably know that. And I had to have at least one music reference. And uh, thinking about living forever brought to mind this great album, Still Life, by Van de Graaff Generator and Peter Hamill. Uh, he really talks about the, uh, the issues of being bored with living forever. Uh, take away the threat of death, and all you're left is the world of make-believe. It's a wonderful song. Um, and then finally, will we integrate with our machines? So this is another way forward, right? So uh, that's been anticipated too in historical fiction. Uh, E.M. Forster's The Machine Stops, 1909. How many people have read that book? Not many people know about it. But he predicted the internet, he predicted uh, telecommunication, telepresence. Uh, but his idea, we just would live our lives in these little cells, the machine would take care of everything for us, we would just be connected to everybody and everything. So you know, we were wired, basically, already anticipating it then. Uh, we, we call it at the Media Lab and, and much of MIT extended intelligence of hybrid intelligence. And this is a research topic that, that rings true in my group, Patty's group, and many groups around the, the campus. Uh, and there are lots of things that go into it. Silicon is good at some things. Biology is good at others. Can we get the best of both at this point? Our brains are already moving outside of our head because of our devices, right? Uh, my identity isn't strictly in my skull now. I have stuff happening in the cloud that is thinking for me. Uh, a phone at arm's length changed the world. You know, we've seen things happen in the last few years that nobody quite anticipated. Uh, what happens when we go further and we have smart wearables and at some point implantables mediating and augmenting everything, right? So uh, they're thinking for us, they're seeing and perceiving with us uh, that we're offloading our cognitive processes to them. It's truly a hybrid intelligence. Uh, and, and it leads to interesting questions. Where do I stop and where do others begin? What's the boundary of self? Do we get to something like the board collective where we're all for one, one for all? Or is there an identity that can manifest or crystallize when it has to? Uh, can we get from mob mentality, which is what social media gives us now, to what some people at MIT like uh, Tom Malone and Cindy Penland call collective intelligence, right? Can we really make this transition and, and do it properly? Or will we retreat into illusion and virtuality? Uh, I just watched uh, Fassbender's 1973 World on a Wire, a great movie uh, coming out of a novel called Simulacron 3 from the mid-60s. 
Uh, that's the idea that we are, you know, we can be in a simulation, but we're also living in one. A little bit like what Ed Fredkin thought here at MIT during the 70s. Uh, but this is another option, right? And uh, Hollywood has, has looked at this too from the Matrix to Ghost in the Shell. And then, of course, you've got Fassbender's movie there too. So people have thought about this quite a bit. And this could be another, another path forward is that we do retreat. We, we, illusion is better in the real world. We play with hybrids at the Media Lab, but virtual and real, which one is going to win? Uh, finally, to look at answers, we look to space quite often. In physics, we do it all the time now. Um, but even when you think about the future of the human, this gets to be really relevant. You look at the universe, uh, it's big. It's incredibly big. Uh, and when I was a kid, it was mind-boggling. Why is it so big? And they keep you know, discovering you know, more galaxies. The Hubble D field shows all these. We start mapping out the universe, finding structure. It's an incredible time to really think at large scales. Of course, Max can talk to that. Um, but that transformation has been astounding, too. If you go back to the time of Lovecraft, when we're just starting to make these observations and realize that these little smudges in the skies were galaxies, there were a lot of them. Humanity is insignificant. We're just nothing. There's so much other big stuff out there. That's probably wrong. This is probably just a bunch of stuff. Because if life is a stochastic process, random, there's a whole Drake equation just for biology of all these improbable things that have to happen to make us. So it could be you need a whole universe worth of stuff for probability to unfold for us to be here and talk. So I think life is rare. Other people think it may be thermodynamically convergent. So life is, is common. At MIT, we have these debates. It's intriguing. Uh, we're going to know soon. This is fantastic. With the work of Sarah Seeger here at MIT, but others all over the world, we're going to image atmospheres of exosolar planets, do the spectrogram, and we'll find biomarkers if they're there. We'll know. And if life is common, to quote the Fermi paradox, uh, where are they? Right? You think intelligence would be favorable? It has evolutionary uh, advantage. Uh, we don't see any evidence of them. There's no geoskill engineering, no communications. They're not there. So what happens? Either we're alone, or these cultures do something else. They don't send out radio telescopes. They don't move planets around. They don't build Dyson spheres. Uh, they're doing something else. Or they self-destruct. So the future of us is very much about what this question is. And of course, if we're the only act in town, we can't blow it. Uh, we got to get it right. And going back to Vandergraaff Generator from the great album Pawn Hearts, uh, there is no escape but to go forward. It's a great song. And Peter is so right. We can't go back. We got to go forward. So, with that in mind, uh, we've got a great panel to address all of these perspectives. Uh, we're going to hear all, you know, people talk about these things in combination by themselves, all together. It's a complicated, wonderful topic, very pertinent. And uh, let's start the, uh, the, the sessions. Thank you.